Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to BioAlberta's Mentorship Series. I'm Rob Stoddard, and I'm President and CEO of BioAlberta, and I want to thank you for joining us today. BioAlberta is a member-driven and funded voice for Alberta's life sciences sector. Our mission is to grow a vibrant life sciences sector to diversify the economy by leading Alberta's recovery. We support and connect researchers, students, SMEs, industry leaders, and funders to advocate for our collective success. Events like today's webinar are part of our mentorship series, which offers access and insight from industry leaders who share their expertise and experience to help grow the sector. Today's webinar is part of a series of four sessions by the Metabolomics Innovation Center at the University of Alberta, which focuses on metabolomics and life sciences. The workshop topic today is focused around agriculture and how metabolomics leads, works with Alberta's leading age companies. Before we get too far, I just want some house, to go over some housekeeping items, a little bit different from the last couple of weeks. Um, the, first of all, the session is being recorded, so if you need to go back and make notes or, uh, or uh, enjoyed it so much you want to see it again, uh, we will have a link to do so. Uh, we would ask that you mute, mute your microphones if possible. And we are also going to take questions from the floor today. So. Um, Please put your questions in the chat and when we reach the, the panel portion of the discussion, um, what I'll do is I'll ask you individually to unmute yourself, uh, put your camera on and ask your question directly to the panel. We do have a couple of, uh, um, of questions that have already been sent in if, uh, if the conversation starts to take a bit of a lull, but if last week's indication and um, holds, we should have a very, very successful event. Um, I expect many of you know Dr. Dave Wishart. That's why you're here today and uh, taking part in this mentorship series. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to uh, to introduce themselves uh, quickly live, and then uh, Dave's going to introduce himself last, and we'll carry right into his pre um, presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob, Steve, and David. Thanks, Rob. I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, be part of the panel this afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Jakeway. Uh, I am the COO at Bionutra here in Edmonton, where we make a fiber uh, reduced sweetener product, uh, both for commercial, uh, commercial clients as well as for uh, individual retail clients as well. Um, and we take a look at the oligosaccharides in the product and how it impacts uh, the gut microbiome. Uh, in part of the prebiotic part of our uh, solution to our ingredient. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Patterson, Technical Director at CBS Bioplatforms based in Calgary. Uh, we're a global supplier of feed additive technology to the livestock sector. And a lot of our work is focused on that cusp of looking at functional feed additives and how they affect the gastrointestinal tract, specifically the microbiome and uh, metabolites that those microbio microbiota produce. Uh, I'm an animal nutritionist by training and I'm really excited uh, to both be a part of this panel and engage in the discussion and to obviously hear this exciting presentation. Great, thanks very much, Rob and Steve and Rob Stoddard. Um, so I'm Dave Wishart, uh, so I'll be presenting today. Um, we'll have about a half hour uh, presentation or talk, uh, and then we'll use the last um, 20, 25 minutes um, to have a bit of a, a panel discussion round table. Uh, I'm one of the co-directors of the Metabolomics Innovation Center. I'll call it TMIC uh, for short. And uh, today I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about uh, both metabolomics and TMIC and its role in agri-food. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna share my screen and get display going and hopefully everyone can see that okay. So what I'll be talking about today is uh, the application of metabolomics to the agri-food industry and um, really to demonstrate how metabolomics can impact um, work done uh, on the farm uh, as well as uh, work done in, in food production and manufacturing. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm with Metabolomics Innovation Center, or TMIC, or TMIC. Um, I'm also at the University of Alberta, um, where I run a large metabolomics uh, research lab. 
So I'll give you a bit of a background. Some of you uh, may be brand new to metabolomics. Uh, some of you may have attended some of our earlier sessions. If you have, this might seem a, a bit of a repeat, but I'll just use the next few minutes to explain, I guess, some background. So metabolomics is formally the study of small molecules or metabolites. Typically we have a threshold, things that have a, a molecular weight less than 1500 Daltons. So that does not include things like proteins, which are much bigger than that. And we look at the um, small molecules in biological samples. So that can be uh, living organisms or dead organisms. It can be cells or tissues or biofluids. Uh, it can be water, it can be soil. What metabolomics does is it allows you to, to inexpensively, rapidly, comprehensively characterize a whole range of things uh, in a quantitative way. So we can look at, at food. Uh, so looking at essential and non-essential nutrients, we can look at natural products, pollutants, um, food additives, drugs. We can look at microbial products. Uh, we can look at um, um, metabolites in general. Um, so it's a broad collection, it covers literally hundreds of thousands of chemicals that are potentially detectable through metabolomics. One way of thinking about metabolomics is with this diagram that I call the pyramid of life and, and how the metabolomics links to proteomics and genomics, uh, those ohms. Um, at the base of this pyramid is the genome or DNA. Um, DNA codes for proteins. Um, proteins are sort of the engines of life or the engines of the cell and they help catalyze all kinds of reactions. Uh, they enable chemical reactions to happen that allow us to uh, move our muscles or to think and talk. Um, so the metabolome, um, which is at the top of this pyramid, represents all those small molecules or chemicals. Um, what I'm also illustrating is not only the connection between the genome, the proteome, and the metabolome, but also the influence that environment and physiology have. As we go up the pyramid, um, there's a greater influence on, on environment or physiology. Every cell in your body has the same genome, but not every cell in your body has the same metabolome. What you eat or drink or what you just ate or drink for lunch today um, changes your metabolome. It, it doesn't change your genome. Similarly, uh, in terms of physiology, uh, every cell has the same genome, but if we look at say the liver or the lungs or the intestines or blood versus urine, each of those has very different metabolites or very different metabolome. So whether it's the environment or physiology, the fact is that the metabolome lies at the interface between the exposure or the environment and the genome. And so that means metabolism is really good at measuring phenotypes. And those silhouettes at the top are, are the phenotypes of different people or humans. And so whether it's humans, animals, plants, uh, metabolomics is a great way of, of getting quantitative measures of phenotypes. Now, as I mentioned, I'm co-director of the Metabolomics Innovation Center or TMIC. Uh, it's a service center uh, that is uh, funded by um, Genome Canada, Canada Foundation uh, for Innovation, uh, Western Economic Development, to do and support advanced uh, metabolomic services and technology development. We started in 2011. There were three nodes in Western Canada. Now there are eight nodes across Canada. Uh, there's 35 staff, uh, $37 million in equipment, and we are now considered Canada's national metabolomics lab. So the website is given there and, and uh, certainly invite you to look at the website to see what's, what's provided. This is sort of the locations of the different centers of, of TMIC across Canada. There's one in Victoria. There are five nodes uh, at the University of Alberta. There's one node at the University of Calgary. Uh, there's another node in McMaster University and um, Hamilton and another node at uh, Montreal and McGill University. There are also what we call affiliate nodes um, where we work with other groups uh, across Canada to help support their metabolomics research. So Edmonton and essentially Alberta is the main hub for metabolomics research, not only in Canada, but the world. And that's something that many people may not be aware of. So I've given you a little bit of a background about metabolomics and about TMIC. Um, maybe here's just sort of a bit of an introduction and many of you may be well aware of these things about Alberta's agri-food industry. Um, Alberta 
is a major agricultural producer. It has a huge amount of Alberta's total farm area. Um, there are tens of thousands of farms with lots of cattle ranches as well as grain farms. Agriculture is the second largest industry in Alberta after oil and gas. It employs almost 100,000 Albertans. Um, there's billions of dollars, whether it's in exports, farm cash receipts, food and beverage production, livestock market. We produce anywhere from 20% to 48% of Alberta's crops. Um, we produce 40% uh, of uh, Canada's cattle and calves. Uh, half of Canada's beef is produced in Alberta. We're also uh, one of the largest producers of honey in the world. Um, so the many products produced by um, Alberta farmers uh, with a very significant impact. And whether it's what's produced or then uh, manufactured or modified, um, the agri-food industry is big. Um, so in terms of the link between metabolomics, agriculture and food, I think it's also helpful to know that some of the very first applications of metabolomics going back 20 years ago were in the analysis of food components and in nutrient analysis. Uh, metabolomics has also migrated to areas of food safety testing, looking at uh, contaminants um, as well as herbicides and pesticides. Um, over the last 10 years, there's been a really significant growth in the application of metabolomics for crop testing, um, fruit, vegetable, grains, um, looking for markers of stress resistance, resistance abiotic and biotic, uh, identifying disease markers, uh, but also assessing quality and nutrient richness. Same thing has also gone on for metabolomics in livestock, uh, whether it's a gain from veterinary applications, breeding, grading, selection. I'll give you some examples later on with this, um, but really fundamentally what metabolomics offers is really fast and cheap methods to, to get actionable information. And that can be used to help increase farm production and profitability, to facilitate food manufacturing and production, and also to improve food, crop, or livestock quality. So this is just an illustration of some of the applications of metabolomics, uh, whether it's uh, food analysis, pest testing, uh, tracing, traceability, disease diagnosis for both animals and plants, um, soil analysis, uh, food formulation applications, more in the area of precision nutrition, quality assessment, wine, beer analysis, just about anything you can imagine where some elements involving a chemical or chemicals um, are relevant uh, to uh, the quality, safety, or appearance of food. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples. I've got, I think, five different groups or, or clusters of examples. And the first one I'm going to do is essentially metabolomics for crop analysis. So this sort of illustrates the process where you start off with some crops or grains. Um, you typically will do some kind of extraction of those. Um, and the extracts are all these colored items, but, you know, we don't get things quite so colorful. In the end, it's the liquid extracts that actually go through um, chemical analysis. And we use techniques like mass spectrometry, NMR spectroscopy, liquid chromatography. These analytical techniques have been around for, for decades. So you might say, what's new about metabolomics? Really what metabolomics does is it actually, it's the, the, the last step. Uh, that innovations of the last 10, 15 years in terms of computer, computer programming, data analysis. It allows us to go from just analyzing one or two chemicals at a time to hundreds or even thousands at a time. And so this has been the real revolution for, for metabolomics and in many fields, other omics as well. That uh, whereas we would be happy with three or four compounds uh, 15 years ago, these days, uh, hundreds is the norm in terms of what you can quantify and detect. So one application that we looked at um, a number of years ago, but it's an example of a crop analysis, looking at uh, brassica or mustard, um, brown and yellow mustard, um, and trying to identify what is um, the key sets of metabolites um, for salt tolerance. Um, we used NMR spectroscopy and looked at how um, these, these plants were grown um, in no salt, 50 millimolar, 100 millimolar salt, and the metabolic responses. And you can see in the top graph, or there's the brown bar, which is the brown mustard, the yellow is the yellow mustard. And there are actually very distinct uh, metabolic patterns that appear depending on whether things were grown in um, uh, high salts and low salts. Overall, what we found uh, is that 
uh, tryptophan and formate uh, were substantially increased in the yellow mustard after saline exposure, whereas proline was used by all the mustard um, plants as a, essentially a, an osmolite to help sustain. So this I suggests that if we want to encourage or allow um, these mustard plants to grow in high salt, low quality soils, that if we select for breeds already that have high levels of proline uh, or that already have tryptophan, or if we can do selective breeding uh, or modifications that these could be um, grown uh, in uh, high salt conditions. And essentially, the idea was to use mustard and, and inquire whether it could be used as essentially a biorefinery crop um, for uh, unusable or salty soils. So this is an example of, of essentially trying to select for or breed uh, plants to tolerate um, high abiotic stress. We've also done a lot of work uh, analyzing uh, vegetables and fruits grown in Alberta. Um, this is more on the area of food analysis. Um, but it, it sort of shows the capacity that's there. Um, what I'm listing is at the bottom, the x-axis, the different methods that we use in TMIC, um, NMR, NMR spectroscopy, gas chromatography, mass spec, HPLC, or liquid chromatography, metal analysis with ICPMS, lipid analysis as well. And the numbers uh, written above each of these bars represent the number of compounds that we identified, in this case, just for beetroots. Um, and the total there, as you can see, is well over 700 molecules. These are what can be identified and quantified. We've not only looked at beetroots, but we've looked at many other vegetables grown in a variety of, of um, um, farms or vegetable farms or in farmers markets that we can get uh, in and around uh, the Edmonton area. Um, in total, there are about 30 that we analyzed in detail and typically uh, anywhere between 200 and 250 water-soluble compounds were identified. This actually represents one of the most comprehensive analyses of, of food ever undertaken uh, in Alberta. Another crop, uh, not really a food crop, but one that's um, growing um, in Alberta, uh, the cannabis industry. Uh, it's worth about half a billion right now in Alberta. Uh, there's about a dozen uh, licensed producers in greenhouses. Aurora is one of the largest. Um, there's more than 500 licensed distributors. We've been developing techniques to characterize cannabis um, at a very, very detailed level, looking at the trace element metals, uh, the polyphenols, the terpenoids, the terpenes, the cannabinoids, a lot of the primary metabolites. And I'll explain some of the results that have come from that, but this is an example again where we're just using the tools we have to analyze a crop product and to identify um, the relevant uh, compounds that the producers are wanting to know about. So in addition to plant analysis, we've also been doing lots of metabolomics for livestock. Um, we will look at um, tissue samples, we can look at blood or urine, um, same approach that I was showing before, which ultimately we look at liquids, we send the liquids into um, NMR or mass spec, and then we do the data analysis to identify, quantify, and characterize what's, what's in there and why it's there and what importance it has. So we've looked at um, uh, dairy cattle uh, for a number of studies, and this particular one we were looking at um, uh, trying to predict which dairy cattle will develop diseases. Um, about half of all dairy cows are affected at some point in their lives with things like mastitis, metritis, ket ketosis, and milk fever. Because these conditions are not that easily handled and some are incurable, about 100,000 dairy cows are killed each year. Uh, and then, so that re represents significant losses to dairy farmers, about $200 million a year. The question we were asking, is it possible to use metabolomics to predict which dairy cows will become sick before they show symptoms? And the point for this is that if you can predict if they will become sick two, four, six weeks before, then there are actually some very simple treatments, um, typically mild antibiotics, uh, that can actually cure them or prevent the disease from coming along. So this is a pilot study that was done and we looked at, at dairy cattle um, up to eight weeks, four weeks, um, two weeks, and then um, at partuition or calving. And we found um, a number of metabolites, which are shown on the left. These are carnitines, acyl carnitine, propionyl carnitine, um, that um, are very good markers 
for predicting which uh, cows will become sick. And on the right is what's called a, a rock curve or CBER operating characteristic curve that measures the quality of this set of biomarkers. And it turns out that this is a really good rock curve. It has an area of the curve approaching 0.95. A perfect uh, predictor would have an area of 1.0. So this really indicates that this, this set of two or three markers is, is very predictive and very powerful uh, for potentially assessing whether uh, dairy cattle will become sick with mastitis, metritis, and ketosis. Another area of interest is uh, in, in what's called residual feed intake, which is a measure of how quickly and efficiently animals from uh, cows, cattle, sheep, uh, goats will, will um, build up body mass. Those that are more feed efficient will grow um, with less feed. Um, those that are not very feed efficient will not grow as quickly. And so ideally you want to have feed efficient animals. Um, there's a formal way of measuring uh, residual feed intake. Uh, we know that not only are feed efficient animals um, uh, more productive, but they also produce less greenhouse gas. The problem with residual feed intake or RFI is it's actually hard to measure. You have to follow the cow for uh, or animal livestock uh, for weeks, and it costs a lot of money. The question is, you know, can you predict residual feed efficiency, or can you just do a simple blood test at some point uh, early on in the animal's life and say, this will be an efficient animal and this one won't be? And so again, we look to see whether metabolomics could predict or identify feed efficiency. And again, uh, it does. Um, we were able to look at um, a group of Angus bulls and be able to identify uh, between the low RFI, um, that's in green, so those are the feed efficient animals, and the high RFI animals, that's in red in this plot on the right. We also identified a number of compounds, um, uh, serine, leucine, formate, um, butyl carnitine, uh, that are really important for distinguishing, and then we were able to basically come up with just a two-component biomarker, which also has a very high predictive ability uh, for identifying feed efficient animals. So again, this suggests potentially a really simple test, a blood test that would allow you to identify animals without having to go through the weeks of monitoring that normal RFI uh, is requiring. We've been moving some of these tests that we've identified, whether it's for RFI, we've done things for pregnancy prediction, litter size, um, also for uh, mastitis and metritis and dairy cow, to develop essentially pen side metabolomics devices. Uh, normally, the samples that we would have to collect would have to go into our big heavy instruments. Um, and while it's not that expensive, there is the cost of shipping. So we've been working very hard to try and make these um, tests and these metabolite measurements something that you could actually bring straight to the cow or to the pen or onto the farm using a smartphone and something that's about the size of a, a small shoebox uh, that would be able to do these tests uh, with both blood or urine. So we're in the process of, of moving forward with a couple of these uh, tests and devices, and uh, hopefully those will be ready by um, early in the fall. Now, there are other examples um, beyond just sort of crop and, and livestock assessment, whether it's for stress or health. Um, we can also do basically food metabolomics. Um, and I guess I've already given you sort of a hint about what's done with uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, where we would, were analyzing uh, Alberta grown vegetables. Same sort of process, you start with a sample, you extract it, you analyze it, and then the software uh, does the rest. Now, food analysis, whether it's in food safety testing, food ingredient testing, nutritional analysis, um, is a billion, multi-billion dollar a year uh, business. Um, and testing is, is widely done, although probably not at the same degree or level that we're, is possible through metabolomics. Mm -hmm. What metabolomics does it is it opens the, the door to being able to uh, assess food quality at much greater detail, food safety at much greater detail, understanding more about test and also about health effects. This is an example of an assay that we've developed for doing essentially food testing. Um, with this assay, which uses a bunch of it, where it runs on a very a number of different mass spectrometers, it's possible to measure almost 711, 13, 713 different compounds. Uh, and all of these are measured, uh, are quantified. 
Uh, you can see that it measures things like lipids. It also measures a wide range of organic acids and amino acids and nucleic acids and biogenic amines. And every couple of weeks, the list keeps on adding. So this is a, 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 a very, very powerful approach. So we're not, as I say, measuring two or three compounds at a time. It is literally hundreds. And it's not just a qualitative measurement. It's a quantitative measurement where we have precise values. We've applied um, the mass spec to doing lots of food analysis. We can also use NMR for analysis. Um, we've been moving towards wine and beer analysis, but also other beverages, including milk um, and juices. Um, in Alberta, there's more than 120 microbreweries and large breweries. Um, commonly with beer and wine, there's often chemical assessments performed to look at quality, consistency, and safety. With our NMR metabolomics, it's possible to detect and quantify more than 90 different components in wines or in beers. And these analyses can be done in as little as 10 minutes per sample. So right now, this approach is now the fastest and most complete test available for alcoholic beverages. I mentioned as well that in addition to wine and beer, we've also been analyzing milk. Um, right now, dairy production in Alberta comes from almost half a billion dollars a year. There's more than 500 dairy farms across Canada. The dairy industry is worth uh, about three or four billion dollars a year. Um, and in 2009, we actually completed the most comprehensive analysis of commercial cow's milk. Um, identified almost 1,500 compounds using the tools and instruments we have. And then we put this into a database called the Milk Composition Database, or mcd.ca. And with the literature data, as well as the stuff that we measured, um, there's more than 2,300 compounds, lots of concentration values for uh, whole milk, skim milk, 1% um, and 2%. Um, so a real useful resource, and it's being heavily used uh, by many groups around the world because it's so complete. And that kind of segues into um, another area that, that TMIC has been involved in. We have the tools to measure lots of things, um, and we could just kind of leave that um, in scattered sheets of paper. But what we've decided to do is actually to put the information that we've collected and make that publicly available in a variety of databases. So one example is the Alberta Food Composition Database where we compiled a lot of the information about the vegetables that we were measuring and analyzing. Um, we've also done this with cannabis. Uh, this is now the world's most complete and comprehensive database. It's an online one called the Cannabis Comp Compound Database. We have information on 115 different cultivars, 6,000 chemical constituents. We have information about what these chemicals do, what protein targets they target, the different mass spectra, the NMR spectra, and the uh, um, references for all of these. We've also created a livestock database that covers uh, metabolites um, for uh, all of the major livestock species, um, cattle, pigs, horses, um, goats, and sheep. Um, we've also uh, got experimental measurements that we've taken ourselves, as well as things that we've been collecting uh, from the literature. Uh, we have reference values, so these are now being used uh, for veterinary diagnostics. Uh, they're also being used to sort of identify and quantify uh, nutrient components um, in livestock meat products. Uh, probably the most widely used database uh, in terms of food uh, is this database called the Food Composition Database or FoodDB. Uh, this has been under development for almost 10 years in, in my lab. Um, it has a little over 70,000 compounds found in almost 800 different foods. Um, it is the largest and it's the most complete database on food constituents in the world. It has information about their flavor, aroma, color, and the effects on human health. And the database itself um, has been widely used by many organizations, many scientists, and, and um, has inspired, I guess, major initiatives from the Rockefeller Institute um, to help formulate food products, uh, to develop predictive software about uh, components and nutrients and non-nutrients in food to improve taste, quality, texture, uh, flavor. Um, it's also, it's not just a database. I mean, there's images of all the different food products, um, all of the different compounds in foods and, and has all kinds of query tools and, and obviously large data sets. And that's all freely available to people. 
So in addition to the data resources and the analytical capabilities uh, that are primarily focused on, on crops, livestock, food, food products, food manufacturing, um, I think TMIC also can help uh, link agri-food to consumers because obviously without consumers, uh, we wouldn't be needing the food. And, and so we've also explored um, uh, the agri-food business from the, from the nutrition um, uh, perspective and, and looking at what happens when people consume food and how it changes uh, their body and how their body responds to that. And that sort of transitions sort of in the area of, of an area we call tr uh, personal nutrition and diet. So metabolomics offers a very fast and, and cheap way of measuring how different people respond to diets and foods. We can look at blood or urine or saliva or stool samples, and we can look at the dietary response. We can look for biomarkers of consumption. And so now we can know if someone really ate what they claimed to eat, uh, because there's literally dozens of, of bio, food biomarkers that we've helped identify. And so this gives people working in the field of nutritional science a much better handle on, on what people are eating um, as to opposed to what they remember eating or selectively remember they ate. Uh, we can also look at how changes in gut microflora um, occur due to what people eat in their diet. We can look at the chemicals they secrete. Um, and so this, all of these capabilities open the door to uh, precision or personalized nutrition. This is an example of, of, of how this is already being done. Uh, we're, we're partnering with um, a company called Molecular U, which has offices in BC and Alberta, uh, where uh, TMIC helps do the metabolomic characterization of, of um, um, blood or urine samples collected from people. And then we use the data and the machine learning capabilities that are in, uh, in TMIC to process the data, uh, interpret, um, and understand dietary um, changes and the effects on people. And then Molecular U has developed uh, software to help um, interpret uh, that data in terms of nutrition, exercise, supplement changes to uh, improve uh, people's diet and overall health from uh, that nutrition or precision nutrition perspective. So I, I've given you at least five examples of how uh, Metabolomics and the Metabolomics Innovation Center can help um, in the area of agri-food. Um, certainly we have more than 15 years of ex experience in working with metabolomics uh, with producers, uh, manufacturers, processors. Um, TMIC is just completing its ISO certification uh, in early June. Uh, has a large array of analytical chemistry services and uh, software databases, and also the capacity to translate these things from sort of farm to fork with developing um, devices and sensors to, to perform metabolomic assays on farm or in remote set settings. We also do complementary and free pilot studies uh, for many groups to help them uh, understand whether metabolomics can help them or to, to learn a little bit more about metabolomics. Uh, Jen Reed, who's here um, uh, in the audience, uh, is our business manager. She's helped organize these, these meetings. Uh, so if you have inquiries uh, about how and what way metabolomics might be able to help you, I invite you to, to contact her. So her email is here. Uh, or to visit the website, uh, metabolomicscenter.ca. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the support that we get. Um, we're able to do a lot of this very, very inexpensively because we get a lot of support from uh, Genome Canada, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, Western Economic Diversification, uh, funding agencies in both Canada and the US. And then, as I say, also a big shout out to our collaborators uh, in the nodes across uh, TMIC. So with that, I think I will wrap up and we can return to the group. Thanks, David, for that uh, that presentation. Uh, as usual, you've answered all my questions, so meeting adjourned. Um, this is this is where the audience uh, audience come, audience comes in. Just a reminder: if you do have a uh, a question you'd like to pose to Dave and the panel, then uh, please put it in the chat and uh, or raise your hand, 
and I will um, I will go to you to ask your question. While you're putting those questions in, let me uh, let me get you started off. And um, uh, David, one of the things that you talked about was. Uh, um, uh, understanding the uh, understanding food better, understanding its taste, its qualities uh, through metabolomics. Um, how does metomolo? How can metabolomics help produce better or, and uh, uh, improve the uh, the trend towards plant based foods that's uh, that's currently underway? And we have a number of members who are actually in that field now. Yeah, so I think um, you know the average plant product, plant food, has about 15,000 different chemicals in it. Um, some of those are, uh, obviously, they're, they're not you know, toxic chemicals. These are things that are phytochemicals. These are natural products. And I think we're really just scratching the surface about what those things can do, uh, both uh, in terms of their health benefits, flavor, aroma, taste, uh, but also how they impact things like you know, texture and other elements of quality. Um, so I think what metabolomics gives you the possibility of doing is, is actually really understanding what is in your product um, and how best to formulate it, uh, how to combine, whether it's certain strains or combinations of, of um, products. I mean, there's tremendous variability. You know, an apple is not an apple. There are many different varieties with different um, chemical features. Uh, we, we distinguish them more by their color. You know, it's a red apple, a green apple, a yellow apple but chemically uh, they're profoundly different. Where they're grown, they're quite different. Um, and so I, I think this is what metabolomics can do, and whether it's for foods or whether it's the concept of medical foods, it's the same sort of thing, looking for specific ingredients that are highly enriched with particular strains uh, or varieties or cultivars. Um, and this is something we learned from working with cannabis, just how profoundly differently different the cultivars are um, and in about their composition and, and their medical effects. Um, thanks for that. And what would it cost if I was a, a, a food company or a producer, uh, agriculture producer, who wanted to uh, um, get you to do a metabolomic assay? So they range, but it's uh, the low cost is around $30 a sample. The high cost is about $100 a sample, depending on how much you want to uh, characterize. So really quite reasonable if you're, uh, if you're looking to produce say the quality or change, uh, uh, change your products. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, typically, you know, one, a one-off measurement doesn't quite tell you enough. I mean, generally you want a bit of a statistical sample where you can say on average, this is what I measure, or this is what we get. Um, because there's a fair bit of biological variability in, in, in products. Um, are there any examples of how metabolomics is being used uh, around precision nutrition and uh, and managing diseases within livestock, uh, actually diseases on both the human and animal health side? So is that for me? Yeah, I, I guess um, there are a few, I think, really good examples. Um, the the work that we've been trying to do with the dairy cattle is, is one focus where we're looking at, at um, how uh, some of these conditions develop and then whether we can modify um, their feeding uh, to supplement where they seem to be short. Um, so there are significant changes when, when cows are about to get sick and um, uh, you see a, a striking deficit of, of compounds. And so that you can tell that their, their body is trying to do their best, but they're running out of the fuel that, that, that's fending off the, the infection. So if you can supplement the diet, then in fact, they can mount the stronger uh, response and, 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 and survive. Same thing is true um, with people. We're seeing examples um, where uh, people think they're eating right, uh, but because of their physiology, genetics, um, they're not processing the food right. And, and some of this could have to do with their microbiome. Um, and so uh, we had one person we know about who we looked at their metabolome and, you know, they were almost like a marathon runner, routinely, um, you know, fit, but um, all of their readouts in terms of the blood and, and urine chemistry were really, uh, really off. And so uh, this person changed their diet quite substantially and found that they had significantly more energy 
um, and now significantly healthier. So there are individual differences that we have and it's not just, you know, one diet suits all. Um, so metabolomics certainly tells us that. Rob, from a precision and nutrition standpoint, is there anything else you'd like to add to that one? Um, no, I think Dr. Wisher just uh, nailed that one uh, specifically on the human side and, and from my experience on the livestock side. Um, Mike, I had a, a follow-up question to that though, Dr. Wisher. Um, thinking from the, the perspective <clears throat> of a, a producer, especially given the intro you had, knowing how big Alberta is and a lot of these producers and uh, on livestock for sure, grain lives so remotely uh, and far distances away from, from your lab. Um, you know, are there any technologies you're developing that are readily available that you, you know, had some proof of concept or, or a little bit of um, um, success with that can be used uh, by the producer on farm, uh, either by the producer or with their consultant, be it a veterinarian or a nutritionist, uh, to add some value to their operations? Uh, and then working with their respective consultants, is, there, is it possible to get those samples in into your lab for analysis? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and we've worked um, hard on a few different things. Um, one is um, trying to come up with really inexpensive ways of submitting samples. Um, traditionally, when people submit samples for metabolomic analysis, it's sort of, you know, you get it in a test tube and you have to put it uh, in a cold chain system and uh, send it by FedEx or something like that. And that's just too expensive. So we're working on methods of where you can just take a biological sample and just put it on a piece of paper, let it dry and send it in. Uh, so it's just the price of a, you know, an envelope or a, a small package by regular mail. Uh, but we're also working on devices uh, where we, we have an engineering team and I mentioned that uh, sort of handheld device. So these are things that, that could be done on farm. They're sort of somewhat specialized in the sense that, you know, the instruments we have in TMIC are, are about a million dollars each. They can do a lot and they're extremely sensitive. So if you're gonna make something that you know, fits into a shoe box, it's not gonna do as well as a million dollar instrument. But uh, we have developed some really powerful sensing technologies. And so the device would be about a hundred dollars um, and um, the little chips that you'd put into it would be um, a few dollars each. Um, so you could do a lot of the testing on farm. Um, but as I say, each of these things is sort of specialized. So uh, we'd have to sort of create the tests for, you know, one for livestock, one for crops, certain types of crops. Um, and they, not, they don't roll off easily. It takes a fair bit of development. Um, so, but I, I think we're, we're trying to be able to offer multiple options where if you could just drop something in an envelope and send it off, um, then that would maybe be um, the easiest uh, route to do it. Okay, another, another question from my list. Are there ways metabolomics can address challenges related to food manufacturing, scale up and quality um, that, uh, that you could help with? Would that be for me or for Eve or? Any, any, of, the, uh, any of them, Steve, you, the, as uh, um, the, the uh, executive with BioNutra, do you have any, any comments on this one? Yeah, you know, as far as it's you know, more from a quality perspective, ensuring that the the product that we're getting out, uh, you know, meets meets what the target is. Uh, we know from our process that we have different lengths of oligosaccharides in in our product, and we know that under a specific chain length, we you know we feed one part one bacteria uh with the ends you know a, a you know one one bacteria in, in our gut and if it's over a specific chain length it, it feeds a different bacteria in the chain in in, in the gut uh and so that, that's important from a monitoring perspective uh to how that impacts the body's uh use of use of that product uh you know whether it's a fiber product whether it's a you know reduced sugar product um, and we, we know that metabolites, different metabolites affect people in different ways. Uh, and the ratio of those, those products, you know, will have an impact. 
Uh, so that that's one way that we can that that Brian, you're just taking a look at uh, at our product and, and and measuring product quality. Rob or Dave, anything else on that? I think um, again, the, the ability to be able to measure a, a wide range of compounds, um, and in many cases, it's sort of you know pick your pick your chemical because it, it's relatively easy these days now to add those uh, into the assays. Uh, we can do that sometimes in as little as as two weeks um, to to add a selection of compounds uh, that that any given food producer may feel is important. Um, so many of the examples I've given are ones where people have said, can you look at this? And so we said, okay, we'll add that. Um, can you look at this one? Okay, we, these are the ones we can put into it. And this is how the, the list of, of chemicals that, that we can measure um, has grown. And, and it's not just the natural product chemicals. We can look at you know man-made chemicals, things that have been um, accidentally added or deliberately added, um, those can also be measured. And, and that way um, we can help with food product production, manufacturing. Um, and, and we can look at how these things also uh, change over time. Um, any food product really is a collection of, of chemicals. And if you throw a whole bunch of chemicals in, uh, you get interesting and unexpected reactions and how these change and how those compounds change over time is actually quite striking. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, things can be dramatically different um, depending on how uh, the food is, is stored, uh, how it's processed, temperatures that it's exposed to uh, in terms of what, what comes out and uh, what's, what you thought <laughs> went in. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. So if you do have a final question uh, or want to get a question in before the, the panel uh, uh, disbands, we'd be happy to take it from you. Um, while, you're, while you're getting those last questions in, uh, just ask one final one to, to, uh, to Dave or to any members of the panel. Uh, can metabolomic analysis of soil tell us anything about the microorganisms in the environment? So um, we found more and more that, that microbes are really nature's chemical refineries. Um, they're there to really do chemical transformations. Um, and certain microbes are very specific um, or, or work on very specific substrates. Um, so by looking at, at soil chemicals, we can indirectly get a readout of what soil microbes are there and whether they're healthy microbes or healthy soil, unhealthy microbes and healthy soil. Same thing is being done actually with analyzing microbes in, in the human gut. Uh, the same interpretation is done. Obviously uh, the microbes in our gut are different than the ones in the soil, but um, the same linkage, the same um, importance, I guess, of, of the chemicals that are produced by microbes um, for soil quality is, is there with understanding about um, microbes in our gut. All right. Um, I see no further questions in the, in the chat line. So I will uh, wrap up and just thank you to, uh, uh, to to David, to Rob, and Steve for spending time on the panel today, and for giving us an, a, a great overview of uh, metabolomics and how it supports the uh, the agriculture and food sectors. Uh, join us. I would just thank you for all for attending today. For more information on uh, on upcoming panels and. Uh, and uh, mentorship series opportunities plus other events, uh, please go to bioalberta.com and, and uh, check out our events page. Uh, you can also follow BioAlberta on social media. Uh, if you do have any further questions or wanted to learn more about TPIC and, uh, or TMIC, sorry, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Wishart's work, you can reach out to him at the Metabolomics Center uh, or to, uh, to Jen Reed as well. And, uh, and I think uh, they're, they're on the social media page, their LinkedIn page especially is up and running and they would, uh, they would love to, to have you engage them on there. Um, with that, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you again to our panelists, and we will see you at the next time.
Take care.